Hello and welcome to episode 10 of Into the Spotlight. I'm Ryan. And I'm Morley. And for our very special 10th episode, we have a very special guest. Um, This is someone who I've talked about in passing, I think, a bunch of times on this podcast. Someone who is definitely an inspiration for me uh, in my 23 years of life. And I think someone who fits the bill of this podcast perfectly. She's incredibly creative. She has made her creative passion her career for the 20 years now, I think. Um, so please join me in welcoming my mom, Kathy Kurt. Hello. Hey, mom. Hi, Kathy. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for coming on. I think I'm, I think for the listener's sake, I'm going to try to refer to you as Kathy, but I don't know how long that's going to last, actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so... One of the reasons I wanted to have you on, like, number one, for the reasons I said before, that you're like this very creative person who is an inspiration for me. But it's also something I've been thinking about recently where it's like, you don't really get a lot of chances in your life to really interview your parents or the people that you've grown up with. Like, you hear about their life in passing um, and in isolated stories. But I was thinking, I was like, oh, I'd be really, like, you have a very interesting life story. And it's always interesting to get the opportunity to actually like spend an hour talking to someone about that and parsing it through. So I was like, oh, this is a perfect opportunity. And it's episode 10. So it's a bit of a special episode. Well, thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, on that, what is the story of how you got into interior design? Because I know it's not where you started your career. Um, And I've always been a little curious about that, like how you wound your way towards this eventual career path. So why don't I tell you what I'm doing now as an interior designer, and then I'll go back to how I got to this point. That sounds good. So I'm 20, 25 years into my career, and I feel like I've just achieved my life goal of where I've wanted to be as an interior designer. So I own my own firm. I have no debt. I'm making good money. I have clients that I really care about and respect who I think feel the same way about me. And I'm responsible for the most intimate places in their life, which is their home Mm -hmm. and one of their largest financial investments. So I take that responsibility to heart. And what's exciting for me is I work with trades people and crafts people as a team. And I have an amazing team and plenty of work. So I feel that I'm in a place of gratitude because I'm intellectually challenged and um, in a good place. Mm -hmm. So my My first formal career was physical therapy, which a lot of people say, well, how do you go from physical therapy to interior design? And I went into physical therapy because I was good at science. I had good people skills. Um, I needed to find a career that would give me a steady income to support myself. So it didn't feel like an option for me in my late teens and 20s to go into something artistic. I had to find something that was a steady, serious thing. So physical therapy was good. But as I started working, I would be in clinical settings that I thought were very drab and depressing and uninspiring. And I kept thinking, why, if people are doing rehab and doing exercises and not feeling well, It doesn't cost any more to have a space be pretty, Hmm. but why are these spaces not pretty and like a drab green and depressing? And in addition to that, I've always had a personal interest in architecture and building. And as a child, my father was an engineer and built our house, the house I grew up in. So I was around the trades from a very young age. My mother was a very talented artistic quilter and she loved textiles. And my father's parents, my my grandfather on my father's side was a very eccentric modern artist who did oil painting. 
in Rhode Island. Oh, yeah, I always forget about that. And my meme, my father's mother, was a very skilled seamstress who made custom women's clothing. So I think in my bones, I was from this very creative, hands-on skill set. Um, so that was sort of a part of me that actually was more important than I realized till I got older. Hmm. So for me to make the transition from physical therapy to interior design, I was very fortunate to have a husband that supported me emotionally and intellectually, but also could take the financial pressure off of me. So I could take that time to take a lot of classes, mentor, um, grow my skill set. So for me, it was a combination of a lot of really hard work and determination and also the support of my husband and my family and my kids. Hmm. And as you remember, when I first started, it was in the basement of our house. So, you know, my young kids would be playing or they'd be at school and be homesick or lay on the couch and I could still be working. Mm -hmm. And then years later, I had a store with my business partner, Eileen Friedman. And the same kind of thing, if there was a school holiday or the kids had a little cold, they could be at the store in the back and, you know, help us put prices on things and put it out at the store. So I owe my success to myself, but I also owe it to the people who nurtured me and mentored me along the way. That's like the best monologue ever. <laughs> That's the best <laughs> introduction I've ever heard. Aww. It's interesting that you you talk about being in these doctor's offices that were very drab and boring and uninspiring. And I think back to some, a lot of your jobs, or at least I feel like you're not doing this as much anymore, but you were doing a lot of doctor's offices um, and dental offices and things like that. Um, did, did that feel to you like you were kind of addressing this thing in your past that always irked you a little bit? Yeah, I guess I never really thought about that, but I did. And now as I've gotten older and every day we're alive, we're all aging. I really think about how important it is um, for our mental health and our physical health to have a home environment that's in, that feels comfortable to whoever you are, because everyone's very different and individual. And also uh, I'm certified in aging in place. So that brings my physical therapy into it. And I always try to make consideration for good lighting when people have a visual limitation, or I do this all the time in bathrooms to be sure that we've at least blocked the walls and taken photographs of where that blocking is behind the shower. So if they don't want to add a grab bar now, we can do it later. Can you explain what that is for the listeners, aging in place and that certification? So certification in aging in place is a signification where a designer or a builder or an architect um, get some credentialing. So we are aware of universal design and ADA laws. So we're, we're sure that when we're building a new setting in a bathroom is just an easy example that we're taking consideration into like the height of the threshold of the shower, mm. the, where the grab bars are, the space you need to get up and down from the toilet safely, all those things. Because as a designer, I always try, it's always going to look great, but if it doesn't function well or it isn't safe, I've let my client down. So yeah. I really try mm. to look at it as a, as a whole project, not just how, not just, it looks pretty. Yeah. And that's something yeah. you've always like impressed upon me as, and I've noticed in your skill set as an interior designer is like, it's the form, it's the function, it's everything. It's somewhere where a person is going to be spending 16 hours plus. I mean, especially these days, they might be spending right. their entire days in this place. Right. Like it's the most intimate form of art, artistic expression and design that you can really do. Right. And I think, I think one, one thing that uh, interior decorators and designers have to be careful of is to, I try very hard to get to know my client and 
one of my mentors, Beverly Payef, who was a design professor at UNH, taught me was to a way to try to evaluate what people really like. Like, do they like a monochromatic theme? Do they like this? Do they like that? Just because some designers will have one certain look and every single picture you see that they've done, you know who it is. But I try not to do that. I try to pull out from my client what excites them, what is meaningful to them. And then I can take the physical things and create that in their space. And it's very, very gratifying for me when it wow. comes together. Well, let's dive down that rabbit hole a little bit because that's something I am also figuring out how to do. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure you can give me some tips on that and probably the people listening. When you're doing a commission work, designing something that you want someone to love and to really reflect their personality, um, what is what is that process look like to try to draw out from someone what they really want and what their style is. So you're not just putting your own proclivities and aesthetic onto them. Well, some of it, it takes some time, but it helps as we go through the process together. They call that the design development phase, which is really critical. Uh, I'm working with a person right now that I'm thinking of, and we started out looking at tile and she thought she wanted a lot of bright, vibrant colors a soft but vibrant. So we started collecting tile samples and color samples. And as we started working together, we started weeding things out. And it was clear that she wanted a more organic palette and we wanted beautiful things, but I do a lot of layering of textures. Mm -hmm. And what we've put together in her home, it's really exciting. We've got porcelain tile and stone and a lot of really hard surfaces but the colors are very soft. So we have soft grays, soft blues, whites, um, different shades of grayages and, and really beautiful layers. And like the colors in their stone fireplace, we found a quartzite countertop that brings those same colors through in different percentages and it's polished. So it's a different, it's a, it's a, it has a different shine, but it's really beautiful because all those colors are kind of like waves in the ocean. So you're seeing mm -hmm. the color in one way in a matte finish, and then you turn and in another angle, you see it in a polished finish with maybe more white. So it's very, my goal is to have a very calm, lovely home. And now I'm putting boards together for her where I'm going to give her and her husband choices where we've got pops of color, you know, to add some brightness and, hmm. yeah. and cheer. Um, so it's a process and I have to depend on the trust of my clients to explore that. Yeah. Hmm. And I would imagine, I would imagine with like 20, 25 years of experience, um, having the confidence in yourself to feel like you can earn the client's trust and maybe do something a little different, like using all these different types of tiles is not something that you could have done necessarily 20 years ago. I would that's think that, that that would be a big growing experience throughout your career is you feel like you can take their tastes and manifest it in another way. Right. It's true. And to be comfortable enough to say, you know, let's, let's explore this and go down one road and I have to be careful too, not to waste too much time because I'm billing them. So, you know, yeah. I don't want to go down this whole rabbit hole down the wrong way. So I try to figure that out as quickly as I can. So I'm being efficient mm -hmm. for them and with their budget. So I'm not wasting their time and money, mm -hmm. um, hmm. but it's, it's gone well. That's fantastic. And I, and I, and as just as part of your creative process, as you're taking like your client's sort of expectations or their desires into account, what are some of those, um, like just what's it like taking those concepts that you have in your head from conception to final design? What are some of the challenges or interesting moments that you encounter along the way? Because it's funny right now, we just did like, <laughs> we're we doing the exteriors of our house here and my parents are taking, you know, the, the cards with the paints and we're wondering, is it the right color? Is it not? And you don't really know until you finally see it. So worse, do you ever encounter some of those moments where 
the concept in your mind and trying to make that a reality? Yeah, so that's 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 something that I try every day to get a little bit better at. The people that hire me are usually people that have trouble visualizing things. Hmm. So I have to try to communicate what's in my mind through photographs and through design boards and putting samples together. And it's different for everybody. Um, I'm getting better at it. I don't feel like I'm as, I still think I have a, a ways to go to make that even clearer. But between computer images and physical samples, uh, that's how I can pull it together. Sketches, um, things like that. Wow. And with paint color, I always try to bring large samples, like an eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of the actual color. So we can mm. tape it up on different walls, you know, when the sun's hitting it in a shadow at night. So they get a a better idea of what the color is going to look like, because I think it's very hard for people to have a little tiny color swatch and imagine what that would look yeah, like in yeah. a whole room. <laughs> exactly. Especially like you mentioned, like lighting, shadows, daytime, nighttime, you know, it changes yeah. the whole look of it. Yep. So there's a lot of like viewpoints to take into account. Right. Right. It's in, like, I think, uh, I think about our house, your house that you designed in Cape Cod and how it can be so bright, um and clean feeling and just very comfortable during the day but then at night it's very comfortable in a totally different way it becomes very cozy and livable and that color palette changes totally throughout the day um, thanks yeah i'm just touching on what ryan said <laughs> um so you talked about a bit like the different types of work you've done and the different types of clients um how has that process been in kind of navigating the different sorts of clients you can work with, whether it be commercial or small renovation or new home build and sort of figuring out what you like best doing and can do the best? Um, Cause I know that's in conversations with you, that's been a huge process in of its own um, in like finding that niche and figuring out the specific businesses within interior design that you want to focus your energies on. The thing I the thing I enjoy the most is starting at the design build prod stage, either with the architect or the builder, fine tuning the plans, walking through the job site, really working on the build and being involved from the very beginning. That's the part that I enjoy the most. The math, you know, figuring out you know the where the electrical things are going, the tile, the plumbing fixtures, and that. And then that segues into, you know, the kitchen and bath design, um, the paint colors, the lighting, how it's all going to flow together. And then we get into the um, the furniture layouts, the furniture selections. The most difficult thing I, I find is usually I never get to the art stage of a project because people, hmm. they think they want my help with art. And then we start looking at art. Hmm. And they want to get art and then we'll look through catalogs and we'll look online and they might like it, but then they want to see it in person. And do they want original art and it's too expensive? Yeah. So that is a struggle for me as a designer. I don't know if other people have that same struggle, but I think art is very personal and um, it's hard for people to let me run with that. Yeah. Like yeah. I think people have a very different relationship with art than they do um, their house in the or space they're living in, which is, yeah, which is very <laughs> weird because yeah. you have a much more intimate relationship with a couch than you do a painting on the wall. But yeah. paintings are like yeah. elevated and they're just, people, I think, compartmentalize them differently in their heads. Right, right. An another thing I do is window coverings and, you know, you want to have... You want to be able to see out and have great views, obviously, but you also need privacy sometimes. You need protection from the sun. You might mm. need room darkening. If you can't reach the window, you might need to have something motorized. So one project I'm on, we're having the motorized blinds all hardwired be 
you know, while they're in the framing process and the electrical. Mm -hmm. So you need to think about that before, you know, the walls are finished. So there, there's a lot of planning involved that goes on behind the scenes. I can only imagine. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, it's really interesting how like people are willing to sacrifice a bit of control in some areas, but in others, they're really like, like, no, I don't want you to touch that. And I, 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 I always think it's interesting hearing you describe your clients as people who like, can't feel like they can't visualize the space they want to live in. Like they need someone else to kind of like make that vision come true for them. Cause I, I don't really feel like I can relate to that. I feel like I would want to like really have, cause I'm, I'm your son. I want to have the control of what my space looks like. Yeah. And I want to, I don't know. Like everyone has their own aesthetic, right? Or at least they have some sense of like what they want their home to be like. So it's weird. Yeah. It's in interesting to hear that some people maybe just need a bit more uh, assistance in that way. Yeah. Or they, they kind of, they know how they want it. They know kind of how they want it to be in the end. They just aren't sure how to get there. Uh, right. Or they don't know where to go to buy it or have it made, mm -hmm. you know, so that's another, you know, a lot, that's another big trust issue. You know, they're looking for my guidance to advise them for, you know, what is the best value for their dollar? You know, yeah. who do I feel is a good vendor? You know, who can they trust? Is it going to come in on time? Is it going to be good quality? Um, it's like hiring a general contractor. It's a very complicated process mm -hmm. right. that most people aren't willing to put all the time and education into. Right. But it can be, you know, and, and it's it's not inexpensive having a designer, but it also is not inexpensive making mistakes with these big purchases either. So oh, I feel like I can bring value because I'm helping people not to make such so many expensive mistakes. So they have a much better understanding of what they're going to get. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, buying a lot of stuff and you bring it home and you're like, oh no, that couch is too big. Doesn't <laughs> <laughs> then I have to put it on the front lawn and hope someone right. takes it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, on that, what are some of those like common mistakes that you think people left to their own devices make with decorating or designing their homes? Um, or like a, some, some common issue you have to come up against like time and time again, someone thinks they might want this, but you're like, no, you don't want that. You want, you want it this way instead. Well, I guess the scale of objects is really important. That's a big thing. Um, I think sometimes people don't put enough value into lighting because I'll mm -hmm. go to a project and they'll be like, well, this room doesn't really feel right. And it's kind of dark in here. Like a, I like, <laughs> I don't really like that, but I love my kitchen. And then I look in the kitchen and it's lit up like an operating room and there's like <laughs> one tiny lamp in the living room and dining room. So it's like, you've got this super bright kitchen and right next to it, you've got these dark drab rooms. So, you know, I'm like, well, I think we need, need to get better lighting. They're like, really? You think so? And I'm like, yeah, I do. <laughs> But lighting is something I think people don't always think about enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and storage, you know, you want to think about too, how do you live? Do you have a lot of books? Do you have a lot of blankets, a lot of throws as we do? <laughs> and um, you want to have places to put all those things. You know, like at the yeah. Cape, we did a new closet and I, it's not a huge closet, but, you know, now we have a shelf that all the sunscreens always there. All the water bottles are right there. All the bug spray is there. So I like to think that it makes it a more comfortable living space because everybody knows where things are. So you can just grab it and go outside and not get bitten by the mosquitoes. <laughs> and you're more comfortable because it's just easy. Yeah, yeah. Right. You can go sit by the fire pit and you're cold, but you know where all the blankets are right by the door. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'm looking around my apartment right now and I'm thinking, yeah, we do not have nearly enough storage. Everything's on top of bookcases. <laughs> Your apartment's small. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just joking. Well, I'm not joking. It's, it's real, but it's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, yeah. So why don't you move back to the U S and join my firm? <laughs> and we'll start doing our the Kirk design build. Well, we'll see, like everything has, seems to come full circle. So who knows? I know. Who knows? <laughs> I'm also thinking about getting my general contracting license over the next two years. Oh, really? Hmm. Wow. Because I, I do a lot of project management on um, 
things that don't require pulling a permit. And I also work a lot with a subcontractor. So we're on a job, they call me with a lot of technical questions. And I think as a woman, it would be nice. It might be a nice um, option for some people that would want to have a female general contractor. Definitely. Um, yeah. So that's something I'm thinking about looking about working on. That's awesome. Yeah, that, I'm just thinking there's a van that I always see driving around here and it's called um, Fix It Females. Oh, really? It's like a, a women-owned general contracting firm. Um, yeah, I'm sure that would do great. Yeah, That's interesting. I thought, I didn't realize that you needed to have a general contractor to pull a building permit because don't some people, if they're doing a renovation on their home, they just do the building permit themselves? You can, yeah, but I would... For it's like to, people want to hire a general contractor doing it that way. Right. Right. That makes sense. And there are different laws in different, lots of different situations, but. Hmm. Hmm. On the, on that kind of side of things, on the more business side of things, um, with 20, 25 years of experience in this, what do you think are some kind of business lessons you've learned along the way? And advice you would give to other small business owners that you wish you had known when you were starting? I should have spent more time educating myself on how to run a business. Mm -hmm. That would have been better. Um, I think it's really important that you have good insurance. Like I have workers comp insurance, which I think is really important. Yeah. Um, I've been really careful with my debt. If I need to invest money and take out a loan, which I did a couple of years ago to grow my staging part of the business, the bank had me write up a business plan, which was really helpful because it made me really think it through. Hmm. Um, so as much of a business plan as you can make. I actually also was just looking into investing in a property to renovate and flip. So I did some research with a contractor I work with to look at the numbers that it would cost. And then I spoke with a financial advisor and it turned out that it was not a good investment at this time because of all the tax implications. So hmm. taking the time to do your homework is really important. Hmm. It must be like, like it's one thing to take a, to dive into a, like a creative profession and then to make it your own business must be like a whole different ball game in a, in a, in and of itself like when you first made that transition starting your business at the very beginning what were what was it like what were some of the challenges like when you were experiencing just what was that like especially at that time at the beginning and finding your way what was that like well at the beginning is it's really hard you've got to um I had to create my own client base. I mean, I kind of feel like I did it twice when I first started in New Hampshire. You know, it was a lot of knocking on doors and picking up small jobs. Um, then you get a bigger job and you feel insecure, like, can I handle it? Right. So it, it took a while. And then you've got to build relationships and your reputation. Um, you've got to build your credit so you can have accounts with fabric companies and furniture companies. Um, you know, I've done a, several trips to High Point. To I used to go to New York a lot to the um, design buildings there and the gift shows all around the East Coast. Then we moved full time to Cape Cod five years ago. I joined a BNI business networking group that I went to every week for about two and a half, three years hmm. at 730 in the morning. And I went to... <laughs> a tremendous amount of networking events in the evening, two or three a week for probably two or three years. I don't think anyone in their right mind could accuse you of not working hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot it's of work. A, yeah. And it sounds like if I could kind of boil down a lot of what you're saying is that a lot of it came down to finding people that you could ask questions of and get resources from like all these networking groups, the partners you worked with, um, the clients that you had to develop. I mean, it, it sounds like in the end, it was really all about the people. I mean, it's a people focused business. Of course it is. But right. And I was, and your... I was really lucky too, because on the Cape, people seem to really believe in me and what I could deliver. And I always try to do my best. So I like to think I have a good reputation. Um, 
And, you know, and I think back to, 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 you know, my, my parents always said it was the golden rule, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated. And that's how I try to work every day with the people I work with and not to forget to say thank you to people. Mm -hmm. Cause if it wasn't for people's trust in my abilities, I wouldn't have my business. Yeah. So I feel really grateful. I mean, trust is so essential when it comes to these endeavors, especially when something creative and, you know, designing someone's home, like having that trust is so important and being able to have that finally established and have all these working relationships must feel so fulfilling. It does. And it's, um, it gets harder too, as you grow, because right now I'm really busy and people are expecting certain work from me and for me to be there. And I have to constantly be working to keep up with my schedule and communicating with people like Yesterday, I was at a job at 7.30, and I had to meet the tile installer, and I had to talk to the electrician, and I had to leave very specific notes, and then I had to talk to the painter, and we've got to cut a certain cabinet another way, and then even though I'm, like, not working today, I'm still, you know, texting with clients, and who's going to be there next week, and I've got the tile ordered. It'll be here in 10 days, so it's a lot of communication. And if I promise to do the work, I have to be sure I can really get the work done when I say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as you grow, that gets harder because there are only 24 hours in the day. Yeah. <laughs> it's like somehow it's still not enough time in a day. Right. It sounds like you're kind of already taking a lot of the um, responsibilities of a general contractor. It's just that getting that licensure would allow you to like have the clout and the, um, the confidence to operate as one. Yeah, but I need more education too. I mean, I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not there yet. So I'll, I, I, I need to be educated more because I still do depend on my general contractors. Uh, right. But that's a goal I have. So we'll see. Cool. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Yeah. My goal is also to come to Canada to visit. Ooh. Yeah. One day. <laughs> one day, hopefully soon. <laughs> yeah. Have you found that like, in COVID times with people spending so much time at home that your work has like shifted in tone or in focus. Um, like I know, for example, like home renovation stores have exploded because mm -hmm. everyone is now doing these like home renovation projects because they're spending so much time at home. Has that kind of affected your business? Yeah. Now, now I, I am not able to see my cl a new client for about a month because I'm so busy. Wow. So you think people are focusing even more on it now that they're spending more time at home? Yeah. I think in the last two weeks, I got 12 new inquiries for projects. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it makes you think what's going to happen with all those like empty commercial buildings. I know. They, I, I, of... they could be affordable housing. Yeah, yeah they could. There could, there could be. be a lot of really interesting architectural projects uh, that yeah. are done with them. Yeah. A lot of artist space or yeah, affordable housing. I mean, we need that in Toronto. There's all these like expensive condos going up. Um, You're telling that, me you, like, don't wanna, are... you don't want to spend 5,000 for a condo more early? <laughs> <laughs> or like 500,000, I should say. Yeah. yeah. People are buying them like before they're built. And then, mm -hmm. uh, oh my God, mom, you would be blown away at the pace of construction in Toronto sometimes. And I've heard some stories like working in the set building of people talking about like, like, yeah, they, they pour these foundations and they are not level. Um, that's geez. tough. Yeah. And it's, I think it's gonna, it's a bubble. And at some point they're going to build a condo and no one's going to move into it. Well, some of them um, are already like that. Like some of them are just Airbnbs. Oh yeah. really? Oh yeah. Some of them, they're just like, people are using them. They'll, they'll buy them and then use them as passive income, you know, rent them out to tourists or to whoever else. Just, eh. I have a, I have a friend, uh, from McGill who just moved to the city uh, he's working on a startup and living in one of these new condo buildings with a few roommates. And he was saying um, their elevators uh, have, or they have one or they have two or three elevators and they broke down such that there's only one elevator operating right now. Ugh. And it's like a, it's a high rise building and with social distancing measures and all these buildings, they say only two or three people can go on the elevator at a time. Um, and as you probably would expect, 
at a certain point, people are not going to follow that rule because if it's five o'clock and everyone's coming home, you'll never get to your apartment with all these stops the elevator will make. So he's just taken to taking the stairs every day. Luckily, he's only on the ninth floor. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I have no desire to live in one of those high rise condo buildings. It feels so unnatural. I feel like I need to be in like right now I'm above a, a commercial space and this it still kind of feels like a house. But to have to go into what feels like a hotel and have a concierge, I just can't, I can't imagine living like that. But some people love that, like a certain uncle we won't name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, for no, that, um, yeah, people are, love it. Yeah, and people are adaptable too. Like I'm sure if I moved there, I'd figure it out. Like first year at McGill, I was kind of living that sort of situation. Mm-hmm. It was it was all college students and it was four f- stories, but it feels very different. I don't know. I'm going to be listening back to this in a few years and be eating my words because I'm going to be living in one of those buildings. <laughs> no, I think, well, I don't know. I, I need some natural space around me. But I do think affordable housing is a huge issue for for um, our, for my kids. And I think it's, um, I think the median price now on Cape Cod is $350,000 for a house. Wow. And that's it's too high, you know, I yeah. think, and maybe that's true I, with the commercial buildings, if they could be converted to condos and have some, you know, park space built around them, maybe that yeah. would be a good thing that'll come out of all this COVID. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Have you looked into like doing any sort of work with affordable housing, um, any like pro bono work or anything like that? Well, Home Builders does things. I haven't done anything yet on the Cape just because I've been so building busy building my business. Right. Right. But yes, I plan and hope to in the upcoming years. Amazing. Yeah. It's funny. Like all the new building, it's like you go around Toronto and it's, it's like McMansions and high rises. (laughs) It's a strange mix. It's a really strange mix. Yeah. Everyone's just ignoring. I mean, I mean, there must be certain, condos that are more affordable for, like not all of the them suburbs, are right affordable. the outskirts of toronto must be more affordable <laughs> definitely definitely I'm, I'm i'm starting to kind of talk out uh my butt i don't know a ton on the issue <laughs> well <laughs> on this it's 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 it can be a little pricey like i know there are somehow it depends on the area but like in in toronto it could be like like seven hundred thousand dollars for a house if not more it just depends yeah. on the area but but you know it's because well like but then again like it's like the biggest metropolis that we have in the country and a lot of offices are there a lot of people go to work there so i guess supply and demand yeah definitely yeah i mean morley how do you feel about um civil engineering and getting back into you know building structures um uh i don't know it's uh i find that i'm using my engineering education every day but the the work pace of working in an engineering office is just not incredibly interesting to me right now. Um, It just doesn't, it doesn't feel as like intimately connected to the final product as I want to be doing. And I think there's a very good chance that I will find my way towards it at some point. But I feel like what I need to be doing right now is kind of exploring these more like creative, inventive paths. I mean, I was looking back through our attic and in the in the kindergarten box of what i wrote when i was in kindergarten and what it said when it says what do you want to be grow up i wrote inventor and i was reading that and i was like yeah that has been kind of like a constant throughout my life i think about like rick moranis in honey i shrunk the kids (laughs) you know like (laughs) like building all the contraptions and stuff and and i i think i would see myself going more that route if it was to go if i was to pursue engineering per se, the more kind of like mechanical prototyping focus, maybe doing a like patent work or something. But I don't know. Yeah. When you're working in an office, designing a building that you may not see or be involved with in the construction, it's just like, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's just not what I really want to do right now. And I think I don't feel like people have asked me this is like, well, then do you regret studying civil engineering? And the answer is no, because engineering even without the civil prefects, you learn how to build things and you learn how to problem solve. 
um, and you learn a lot of general physics and math skills that can be applied to a wide range of things. Um, and whether it's fair or not, when someone sees McGill civil engineering on your resume, they're like, oh, that's, uh, that's interesting. This person probably knows how to do some stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll see. I don't know. I'm, as you've said, as I've said, and as we always say on this process, on this podcast, it's always a process. We have this kind of running joke that like someone always says that on the podcast at least once. It wouldn't be an episode if we didn't say that at least once or twice yeah. or five times. It depends. And Ryan, yeah. what is your background? So my background, my background is in, so I study communication studies at Concordia University in Montreal. So it was like a lot of learning about like media theory and learning about, you know, political communications, advertising, marketing, like a whole range. And, and on top of that, I also learned more of a media production background, which I went and did my master's at Ryerson in Toronto in media production, Oh yeah, which really, you know, dove into like video production, audio, um, graphics, and also all different other types of communication theory. So that's pretty much my wheelhouse, so to speak, because I don't know, I have like a lot of interest in a lot of different areas. I came from a more of a social sciences background. So like history, sociology, politics, and then I just had this real love of media and I've been loving, I always call myself as a, a filmmaker since I was about like eh, seven or eight years old or so. So yeah, so like I learned all those things and right now I'm doing marketing for a technology company in Toronto. So yeah, I'm just, I just love doing creative work, but also drawing upon, upon like just all these different types of ideas and imagery and just phenomena from all these different types of areas and being able to blend it into something that's you know compelling and i think hard, ryan and i hard, are very yeah it's hard to it's hard to like it's so there's so many areas of interest i have it's hard to like boil it down to one thing but i just love doing different types of creative work i love writing i love just being able to you know express myself in a lot of different ways i come from a very irish catholic family so you know storytelling is you know all in the dna so to speak so oh that's nice yeah so i think yeah, sorry, go ahead. And I, I think Ryan and I are very similar in that way is that like we both have a very like wide ranging set of creative interests, like in filmmaking and storytelling, in audio. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I think like we could kick off a conversation with only knowing each other for a short amount of time. It's like we all find these different creative paths very, very interesting, which is in a way become this podcast. Exactly. All these different creative paths and just and just um like, discussing them. Ryan, do you like Celtic music? Oh, I love Celtic music. I love folk music. Yeah. Oh, I do yeah, too. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. You know, St. Patrick's Day, like we have these old CDs. Remember what CDs are? I do. And like we just play <laughs> them and oh, yes, absolutely. And like my um my uncle because we I'm in, I'm located in Quebec and my uncle in Quebec City, he is part of the Irish heritage in Quebec and he you know, he has the whole family tree. He has he understands pretty much the whole history of the irish in quebec during and after the great famine really? oh yeah yeah and he takes people and academics on tours of like the graveyard sites and you know where people were buried and we have in quebec city a place called gross ill which was kind of like kind of like canada's ellis island so to speak and there's a large <laughs> history behind that so so yeah so like just and like and they've all told me stories of like of their time and of like our grandparents and even beyond that and all their experiences that they've done. So, you know, that, that impacts me a lot. That's where a lot of my his, interest in history comes from and how that's all branched out. So yeah, it's, I'm sorry. I don't, I can't remember what your original question was, but yeah, it's just, <laughs> that's like, it's a big part of my identity and that's just kind of been a, a big part of my creative background and topics that I want to explore, which is also like a documentary project that I'm working on right now that I'm trying to prepare, which explores some of those ideas. So, so yeah, it's all exciting. That's so interesting. I didn't even realize there was such a large Irish Catholic population in Montreal. Oh, yes. Uh, not even yeah. just in Montreal, but all throughout the province. Like, even here in my town of Gaspé there, there's a community here called Douglastown, which is very, very Irish, very Celtic community there as well. Yeah. So oh, it's interesting. So you're, in up, United... you're um, near Ottawa. Oh, oh, actually, I, or I'm He's actually, right, yeah, I'm like on the opposite end of Quebec. I'm like closer to New England than what Morley is. <laughs> like I'm right beside oh. the Canadian Maritimes. Like I'm in a region called Gaspésie, which is just above New Brunswick. Oh, wow. And it's funny. I actually have like ancestors from 
or not ancestors, but I actually have like great great grandparents in from Manchester, New Hampshire, which is funny. Oh, I didn't realize. That. I I know. I just thought of that because I asked my mom. Said, "Mom, don't we have you know great great relatives from yes and yes?" Because I remember when we visited Boston for the first time nine or ten years ago or so. I remember we were there like looking for their grave the graveyard, the grave sites. Did they work and, in the mills? I think they did because they, they traveled a lot did. between there and Nova Scotia, which is where my grandmother was born. And then eventually they moved up to to my hometown of Gaspe. And, you know, history has a funny way of of, <laughs> of rolling like that. But right. Yeah. And that's like my relatives. So your relatives also worked in textiles. Yeah, especially yeah, because in New England around in that time, in that era, in the 1800s. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. it's funny, like in the U.S., we don't learn or I didn't learn a lot about canadian history like a lot of our history stops at the 49th parallel um <laughs> I can't, and i've I... learned i've learned so much since coming here about like yeah like that whole um lineage people immigrating down the saint lawrence river um and the interaction between like halifax and montreal and how one port kind of affected the other mm-hmm. um, yeah and like yeah, it's there are really all these centers of immigration, and oh yes, especially in the Irish, the Irish history, Irish history of of immigration to the U.S. and Canada are so compelling in that way. But like, in, but it's like that for all people of all backgrounds who who emigrate to different areas. Each one, each person's journey is so interesting, compelling, and that shapes a lot of like of who we are, and you know, the paths that we lead and the stories we tell. You know, it's all yeah. it's all it's all interconnected in that way. Yeah, yeah. that's great. So, yeah. And to kind of like to bring it full circle, um, I have been feeling that a lot recently. And like in in mom and hearing about your um, like the details of your work and how you are inspired from some of like your ancestors and it kind of being in your blood to a certain extent and growing up around that. And I kind of feel that with you and through like grandma and grandpa and other people in our family and it's around. It's like you you can't get away from the who you are you know like some people say it's like you should see what you were into at age like nine to 13 and then just do that because in the end like that's what's going to make you happiest that's what you're going to be most successful and passionate doing and that's like what you're meant to do oh i've never I think heard it was, that that's neat yeah i think it was like victor frankel or someone who had a quote where it was like it is every person's duty in life to figure out what it is they're meant to do um and i think like you're doing yourself a disservice by not doing that thing if you if you realize that like this is what i want to spend time doing and so important to feel like like you know for it to be compelling fulfilling personally you know that's so important especially no matter whatever it is that you do yeah although i mean to be fair like mom you were saying like at the beginning of your career like you needed a stable career to support yourself Mm -hmm. and you you needed something that could show up and i feel very lucky that i'm in a bit of an easier position that I have a bit of leeway and I can afford to take a bit of time to wend my way through this path. So right. I and, mean, on and, the topic of gratitude, all... I am incredibly grateful. Yes. <laughs> and we're fortunate to be um, in that situation because you think of all the people in the, all over the world that may not have enough food or not have any shelter, mm-hmm. you know, so, you know, that's, it, it's good with all the, negativity in the world right now it's important for us to remember that and just have some gratitude and and i think that's great you guys too oh absolutely well listen we're wrapping up on four should we yeah let's uh let's change gears to what we're putting in the spotlight this week and mom since you are our guest i'll let you go first okay so my inspiration this week is and I'm going to ask people to do this is to tonight to go out and look at the sunset and look at all the colors that you see with the black and the gray of the trees and the buildings. If you see water, the sky, all the grays, the pinks, the purples, whatever colors you see and try to remember the beauty that you see. And then the next week, find a physical something that brings those colors together and put that into your living space. Oh, that's such a cool idea. Whether it's a plant, a vase, a pillow, a picture, something. So take those colors and find a physical thing that you can add to your space to remind you of that sunset. 
I love it. That's beautiful. I know what I'm doing tonight. <laughs> All right. Um, I will go next. So I have been uh, straight up binging a podcast recently. Um, it was recommended me uh, to my friend Ben, a uh, fellow maker who runs Make for Life Workshop. Uh, shout out to him. Go check out his stuff. But it is a podcast called Startup Podcast. And you can guess what it's about by the title. Um, it's it's actually a older. I mean, it started in 2014. Um, it's weird to say that 2014 is older, but it was six years ago now. Um, and it is an in the moment podcast about starting a startup. So this guy, um, Al, oh, I can't remember his name right now. I'll put it in the show notes, but he wanted to start a podcast company. I know it's very meta already, but he came from NPR. He was work. He worked on this American life and he wanted that to make show. a production. Yeah. He wanted to make a production company that created new shows and found a more reliable way to monetize podcasts because at in 2014 podcasts were not nearly as big as they are now. I think that was right when serial had was starting to gain some traction. And a lot of people say that that was the, the true uh, watershed moment for podcasts in general. Hmm. So what he did was while he was going through this process, starting to talk to angel investors and everything else, he started recording it and putting out episodes as he was going through this experience um, so in the first episode, he talks to Chris Saka, who is a very well-known uh, Silicon Valley investor. Uh, he was on Shark Tank, I believe. Um, and right off the bat, Chris Saka tells him, he's like, your pitch is terrible. Like, we need to fix this. And he records this like as they're on their walk. And he, he thinks he's talking to him for an investor meeting. But Chris Saka is like, there's no way I'm investing. You need to tighten this up. So it's very, I mean, he records conversations with his wife while he's like in the trough of sorrow, just like, there's no way I can make this work. And it's, it's incredible. It's half an hour episodes. Um, it's a spoiler. It's a successful, I think, podcast company now. Um, so they, they have found some uh, way of success. And then they go on to follow other startups uh, throughout the rest of the podcast. So it's, it's really good. It's, it tickles a similar spot as How I Built This, which is another business podcast that I love, but it's very different because it is way more in the moment and it's not like romanticizing it in hindsight, talking about the guys starting their tech company in the garage. So yeah, check it out if you're into that sort of stuff. That's that's beautiful. I don't know if I can follow up Kathy's into the spotlight, but I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's our 10th episode which is a big deal. It's a big milestone. And, you know, we had a great conversation with Kathy, with Kathy about, you know, all of these different types of topics. I even know it's technically our, our 11th episode, but we're podcasters, so we can't count by definition, but that's okay. Oh, yeah, you're right. Because <laughs> we started episode, we did episode zero. zero. <laughs> right? <laughs> so we, um, we've discussed on the show a few times about how we first came up with the idea of this podcast. We were going to that creative conference a little bit over a year ago now. Or almost a year ago, and talking about you know doing a show like this, interviewing all types of different types of creators and artists from a wide range of backgrounds. But the initial idea for me to even have this desire to do a show like this started many many years ago, and this came from a show that I used to listen and watch, or I still listen and watch, called Off Camera. Off Camera is a show that is a web series, a podcast, and a digital magazine. It's hosted by Sam Jones, who is an American actor, photographer, and documentary filmmaker, I believe. And it's a really, really great, phenomenal show that interviews uh, different types of creators, artists, actors, musicians, comedians, and all other types of uh, performing artists from an incredible range of backgrounds. And it one thing I really like about this show is that it really just delves into learning about these people's creative um, journeys, how they made it to the very top of their professions and just hearing them, how this hearing people like Robert Downey Jr., Ethan Hawke, Jeff Bridges, Sarah Silverman, Constance Wu, all different types of amazing performers and how they're still, you know, how they still have certain vulnerab vulnerabilities in their professions, how they're able to navigate the, uh, um, the world of entertainment, how they're able to succeed in all these different ways and just how they're still trying to fulfill themselves creatively going from their humble origins to where they are now it's a show that i think that a lot of people would like to listen to i listened to this for 
many, many times on the days when I was traveling back and forth from Montreal to my hometown on 10 hour long bus rides. So yeah, I know very brutal. Don't recommend 10 hour long bus rides, but eh, what can you do? I've been there. I wouldn't recommend them either. No, <laughs> not good. But it's a really great show. And that's the show that first gave me this idea of, of you know, working with Morley on a podcast about the show, but interviewing creators from like, you know, from a more grassroots level. But this show first gave me the idea to even have the desire to even go after this and to seek out amazing creative people and just learning about their journeys and where it is that they want to go. So this show is really great. I really recommend that everyone can go check it out. You can check it out on Netflix Canada. It has the first three seasons on it. And it's really filmed in this nice black and white photography that uh, that just washes everything out, but it washes everything out, but it just makes you focus on what they're saying. So yeah, it's a phenomenal show. Really recommend it. Go and check it out. Would you repeat the title again, Ryan? It's called it's called Off Camera with Sam Jones. Okay. And the podcasts are all free all on their website. Well, thank you. You're very welcome. So it has all kinds of interviews with some of the most creative, interesting creative people today. But it's not like, you know, it's not like the Tonight Show interview. Like these are really in-depth conversations about creativity, what it means to be creative, how to overcome your struggles and, you know, your challenges and just being able to be authentically creative as you can be, which is what I hope this show can be as well. Yeah. Well, you two are already very successful young men. (laughs) <laughs> thank you thank you there's so many places i want to go yet but i feel like i'm on the right track good yes um well mom thank you so much for coming on this was a really great it's conversation. Been an honor thank you both ryan and morley thank you it was a pleasure to meet you it was a pleasure hearing about your story and how you become so successful and for a lot of people who are just finding their way because i know a lot of people like similar in age to morley and i who are making a change going from like one field to another and they're just trying to figure it out. So hearing your story and how you've been able to succeed is just amazing. So, so thank you so much, Kathy. Oh, thank you guys. Good luck to everyone. Yes. Um, if you want to see Kathy's work, uh, you can go to her website, kathykurtinteriors.com and her Instagram page, Kathy Kurt Interiors. Those will all be linked in the show notes. Um, yeah, check it out. And then we'll, we'll post some stories of, um photographs from some of her some of her work which is beautiful thank you all right have a great rest of your day thanks you guys it's great bye Bye, guys Bye. bye